Hello beloved, this is Mandala on Mandala Loves Jesus and I invite you to continue reading with me in the book of Matthew of the Your King James Bible in the New Testament. The last time I stopped reading the blessings of the Sermon of the Mount and I came until verse 13 where it speaks about the salt of the earth. So Jesus says, Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost his savour, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. So Jesus is saying that we are the salt of the earth and that we need to be of esteem. We need to have savour. We can't be without savor, we can't be neutral, we can't be tasteless. When God looks at your life and he finds that you are of no esteem, that you are without savor, that you are lukewarm, that you are neutral, that you are trying to please all men, like you are not, not taking position for anyone nor against anyone. You're always trying you're always trying to be in peace with everyone even then when it comes at the cost of the truth. And that's not good. So Jesus says, Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost his savour, wherewith shall it be salted? So if the very thing that is brought into existence to give savor has lost its savor, there's nothing else less left to add savor. It's like thinking, if all the salt of the earth has lost its savor, there's nothing I can put in my soup. There's nothing that really can replace salt. And even our bodies need salt. You can't just replace salt with pepper. It's not the same. Your body can't process pepper the same way like salt. And your body cells can't use pepper the same way as they do use salt to obtain the right balance of pressure because when your body cells are lacking salt, the cell implodes, collapses and dies. So it's important for the body to have enough, sufficient salt to bind water and to maintain the cells stable. But if you don't have salt, or if you have all the salt of the world, but it lost its function, it's not good anymore. The function of salt is to has, have savor. If it's not having savor, it's no good for cooking, and it will be cast out. It lost its savor. Why would you have it occupying space if you can't use it for anything? And that's why it gets trashed. It gets cast out to be trodden under foot of man. 14. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on an hill cannot be hid. I was living in Salzburg in Austria where there is a huge castle upon a hill. I put the image there. So that's Salzburg where I have been living in Austria and when you get close to the city even from very very far off you already see the castle of the city it's an eye-catcher it's completely inevitable that when you come at kilometers close to it you already see the castle there or when the planes they come crossing in to the airport and even when you're far off the city, yet you already see the castle on the hill. 
So Jesus is saying a city that is set on a an hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a, bu a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. So the candle, you won't put it below the table, because if you put it below the table, or if you put it under a bushel, you won't see the light, you're wasting the ability to lighten the room, the house, right? But if you have, if you put it on the candlestick near the ceiling, there's no one crossing to the light, nobody's interfering, so all the people can enjoy the light from the candlestick. And he says, it giveth light unto all that are in the house. And he says, let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So you are meant to be the candle that is on a candlestick, like the seven spirits of the Father that are on a candlestick to work for the Father. So the Father is glorified through the works of the seven spirit, of the seven spirit. Because the candles, they are sustained by the candlestick. If you're reading Isaiah, and it, he's talking in this Isaiah 11, he talks about, the prophet talks about the seven spirits that are upon Jesus Christ. He's prophesying about Jesus, that the seven spirits of God are upon Jesus. So the candlestick, the candlestick is sustaining the seven spirits. Like the candlestick is sustaining the lights that are put there on the candles, right? Now there's something very interesting. In the tabernacle tent, in the tent of encounterance, in the Old Covenant, the Lord showed Moses to make a candlestick, to put the lights on there. So the lights of the candlestick give light to the whole tent where is the presence of the Lord, right? And this candlestick had place for seven lamps. And the seven lamps, as tells us Isaiah 11:2 of the seven spirits of God and those seven spirits are sustained by the candlestick okay the candlestick is God the father who is sustaining the seven spirits so you have the spirit of the Lord the spirit of wisdom the spirit of understanding the spirit of counsel the spirit of might the spirit of knowledge and the spirit of the fear of the Lord. So there are the seven. And those seven spirits are represented by the seven candles in the Old Covenant. And the Lord said to Moses, put oil on these lamps and never let them go out. Like they always have to burn because the seven spirits of God are always working. They never stop. They are they never are weary, they are never tired. So coming back to Matthew, Jesus says, Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in, in heaven. You can learn that the seven spirits that came from God, the Spirit of the Lord, and all the six other spirits, that they are shining light before man. And they are working so the Father in heaven gets glory. Every time the Spirit of Wisdom is working through Solomon, the Father in heaven gains glory. Every time the spirit of might 
worked some, a, a powerful work for the Lord or gained an important war for the Lord that's for the glory of the Father so the Father himself he put in place the examples for his son beforehand and then Jesus did the very same thing he manifested in the life using his body as a temple to manifest the activity of the seven spirits that came from God to glorify the Father which is in heaven and this is exactly what Jesus did he put he put the lights on the candlestick so Jesus gave light to everyone around him and his disciples are called to give light to everyone around them it's like a chain of light like the father gave light to the son and the son gives light to his disciples and the disciples spread the light and so on 17 think not that I am come to destroy the law of the, all the prophets I'm not come to destroy but to fulfill so Jesus is saying I'm not come to tell you okay now you can lie now you can steal now you can commit adultery now you can break whatever commandment of the Ten Commandments that God gave to the people through Moses but he's saying I, I'm not I'm not come to destroy the law I'm come to fulfill the law I'm come to not lie I'm come to not desire of my neighbor I'm come to not commit adultery against my brothers I'm come to not give false witness and I'm come to not live in idolatry or worshipping other gods like when Satan tempted him in the desert when he was fasting no he's saying I came to fulfill and that's what he did by not sinning and by obeying the Father he fulfilled the law and not only this he refined he refined the approach to righteousness when in the first place no one said in the old covenant okay if you think in your heart this is a nice woman but she is married and you are, th and you are thinking sinful thoughts of fornication there was no law against it yet but through Jesus Christ two things changed one is you received forgiveness through Jesus and you received grace through Jesus but also at the same time you don't need to lay down with the wife that is already married and committed adultery Jesus is saying if you are lasting in your heart you already committed adultery so Jesus is Jesus is putting on the loop on your heart He's exploring your heart and you are mentioned to live in finesse for the Lord. You are, me you are meant to be sanctified and to live, com live completely holy and to lay down your life as a living sacrifice to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because if you're not laying down your life as a living sacrifice on the altar of your heart to the Lord Jesus, it's completely impossible for you to not lust after other women, for instance. For verily I say unto you, verse 18, Till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. So Jesus is promising by the authority that he has by the fa from the Father, that whatever you think, there's no way around it you won't escape 
You won't escape the promises of God until everything is fulfilled. No one can change it. There's no way, it's absolute will of the Father. Satan can change it, the angels can change it, no one can change it because it's, it's a de decision taken by God. And you have two options, you rebel against it and fail, or you go along with it. 19. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So he's saying, if you are not working precisely, if you are not striving for perfection in righteousness, if you are not striving to have a sharpened conscience, if you think that just by respecting the Ten Commandments you are um, you're all good with God, there's nothing more to do, like you are resting yourself thinking that you already are good and there's nothing more to add, you know? Like if you are, if you are falling into a, a state of stagnation, then you are going on the wrong path. Because when you are stagnating and your conscience is not sharpened, you're committing errors and you start to break the least of the commandments and start to teach wrongly so to other people. And that may not cost you your eternal life, so you still may get into heaven at the end because you have been working for the, for the Lord and you are not working for the enemy and you are loyal to Christ but you are not working exactly you are not working precisely you are working chaotic and you are not obeying 100% but in some cases the grace of God still saves you Whosoever shall do and teach them. So, whosoever is doing all the things that the Lord commands and teach them. So, doing both of them. Applying it in your own life, living it as an example by application and teaching them through word, through example, through motivation, encouraging other people, correct correction of the church, correction of the body of Christ, putting conviction in the lives of sinners, ministering to people that are lost in the world but they are sick of, of sin and they want to come out, winning souls for the Lord. Whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because there, I suppose, there are very, very few people that are so dedicated that they are sharpening the conscience permanently and applying it all in their life and teaching it without ever looking back. Like there are a considerous, I would consider there is a big part of believers that that obey to the Lord, but they are not rejoicing by obeying to the Lord. So they are not happily following what the Father asks, but they do it because they feel like, well, if I, if I want to get into eternal life, there's no other way around it. I have to obey. I, sh I, I have to go into the vineyard and help. If I'm not helping, I will be damned. But it's not the same if you have two, per, two people that are working side by side um, helping you in your vineyard and one is very happy and he's always motivated and he's working and working and going on. He's, he's never getting tired and he always wants to do something more. And then you have the other person that is obeying and he does what you ask for, but he's not he's never doing something more, you know. You say, put those ten things over there, and he puts the ten things over there, but he doesn't 
he's not he's not open to to look if there's something else that need to be done or you know while the other guy that is super motivated he put the 10 things over there and at the same time he fixed two other problems you know because he's taking initi initiative but does that mean that that the person that complied only with the two things that you asked the person for that he's your enemy and that you will cast him out and you will take him that you will fire him and take off his job as long as he is working well and he's not you know he's coming every day in the work and he's not he's not off work suddenly you know see he's complying but without any extra initiative he's not your enemy or anything but he will be but he's working slumpy and chaotic and sometimes it's not the results are you know wiggly waggly and so he is part of your he's part of the family you know but he will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven while the other guy will be called great in the kingdom of heaven because he's striving for perfection all time and if he strives so so for being obedient sacrificing his own life completely forgetting about himself and when you forget to completely about yourself God starts to work really through you and before that not and not before and that's the difference I think that's enough for today we read only from 13 to 19 I think but the video only ha already has more than 20 minutes so we carry on another day <laughs> I hope you enjoyed it. There will come more if the Lord wants. Be blessed in the almighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I love you guys. See you soon. Bye-bye.